So I want to go over what we did after the quiz on Friday, which was introduce some things with graphs. I know we used, uh, we made a couple graphs in the lab we did earlier this week, which was the nuclear radiation and decay and the half-life lab. Um, and I used that as kind of almost a preview and to see how um, students did in terms of making line graphs, bar graphs, things like that. And while some things were okay, there's some definite things I want to make sure that we go over as a class. And we're going to be using graphs a lot in the labs we do from here on out. So a, a well-designed graph is something you should be able to look at for about 10 seconds and figure out what it's trying to say, at least if you understand the material reasonably well. If it's a very complicated material, that's a little bit different. So the first thing you want to do when you're making a graph is choose the right kind of graph to show the information. Because the whole point of a graph is to show things quickly and easily. So line graphs, pie charts, bar graphs. We used a line graph and a bar graph um, in the lab that we did recently. Almost exclusively from here on out, we're going to be using line graphs. The reason is they show relationships between things. So if you notice, we will also tend to make a line of best fit in here. We don't tend to connect the dots, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But we'll occasionally use these. This is by far and away what we'll use. The first thing to do when making a line graph or any sort of graph is to scale the graph properly. So it doesn't have to be from zero, but the scaling should be consistent. So if you notice here, this does go from zero on this axis, axis and it goes by even increments. So you want to have simple numbers. Even if your top data point was maybe like $604, you wouldn't go up to like 604. You want to have nice even numbers. Here, this does not go down to zero. It only goes down to 10. Many times our graphs will scale all the way down to zero, um, but they don't have to. So you want to title your graph. Normally you would have it as um, the X, titled like the y-axis variable versus the x-axis variable. So for example, in the lab we did, our y-axis variable was amount of atoms remaining, and our x-axis variable was flip number. So the title would be atoms remaining versus flip number. You want to label each axis with units, so this graph is not proper with that. It should have money or cost over here. And this is labeled and it has the units as well. So again, this is labeled and it has units as well. Um, you want to put the numbers on each axis, so those are here and here. Um, and again, you don't need to number every line because you want people to be able to see things quickly. Sometimes if the lines are very close, that can make it messy. So when making a graph, we normally make a line or curve of best fit. Um, we don't connect the dots because graphs are supposed to show the general trends of information. And when we collect data in class, we could have experimental errors or uncertainties, which are things that really um, are not important to the general trend. They make things look messier, and they actually distract you from the general trend. So this is the toughest part, I think, when we make graphs, is to decide which variable goes on which axis. The dependent variable, which is called the responding variable, is placed on the y-axis, and hopefully you know from math that's the vertical axis. And the independent variable, and that's what you are choosing to change, is placed on the x-axis. So you can think about it like cause and effect. The cause is what you're doing, that's on the x-axis. The effect is the dependent variable, and that's on the y-axis. Sometimes it's tough to figure this out, so we'll need to practice this. And there's a few times where I'll purposely ask you to put things on one axis or the, another, just to have understanding of something that I want to look at that may not agree with that. But in general, dependent vertical, independent horizontal. So for example, if we think about someone who's a cross-country runner, and they, go to, and they do practice a certain amount of time a day, we could think about comparing and graphing out miles run compared to time run. Well, you as the runner would choose the amount of time you run or you practice each day. So for that's the independent variable, and then how far you run would depend on that. So we would have distance run over on this side, time um, for practice down on the um, x-axis. We have a few different types of relationships we can show. A direct relationship is when one thing goes up, the other goes up in the same proportion. So sometimes that's called a linear graph or directly proportional. An inverse or indirect relationship is when one of the variables goes up and the other goes down. So for example, if you were comparing, say, people's income to poverty level, as income goes up, poverty level goes down. 
An exponential graph happens when one thing goes up somewhat and the other goes up very, very rapidly. So this would be an example of human population on Earth. It's been exponentially increasing for a couple hundred years now. <clears throat> and finally, there's times where we don't have a relationship between things. It looks more like a scatter plot. So as one thing increases, the other doesn't seem to change. I'm going to do an example in the second part of this video or a second video that deal with um, data comparing the cost of gasoline to the amount of gas that's bought. And I'll talk about that. I'm going to project that up on the board. Okay, so I will stop. To go through this fairly quickly, I to try to project it up on my blackboard, which is what I did in class. did not seem to work. So if we have this example, cost of gas that you purchase compared to amount of gas, the first thing we want to think about is what variable is going to go where? Well, you could think of this either way, as in the amount of gas that you buy depends on how much money you have, in which case the cost would be independent. Or you could say, hey, how, if you fill up your tank when it's empty, or like once a week, and you need different amounts of gas, you choose how much you buy, the cost depends on that. So in this case, I'm going to assume how many gallons of gas you buy is independent variable and the cost is dependent. So I'm going to Put the cost over here, dependent variable goes in the vertical axis, and then I'm going to have down here, I'm going to end up having this as amount of gas, and that's in gallons. So notice I'm putting units there as well. So I'm going to have that down there. If I want to have a title, basically what I would do is I'd have y axis versus x axis. So I would have something where I say cost versus amount of gas purchased. So something like that. The next thing is we need to put units on there. And this is one where I was hoping to put this on the board instead, but we shall see. So if I have something like this, actually I could probably do this here. If I look, there's 16 boxes across here, and the most amount of gallons is 15. So I definitely could number that. And again, I wish I could do this by hand. I don't think that. I'm going to try to justify this to the left, I hope. I was thinking about that. It goes over here. Oops, that is the wrong way to do that. Let's try that again. Okay, that's weird. But anyhow, so we'll say this would be zero. Oh, this is weird. This is not doing what I want it to do. Let's try it again. So now I'm going to format this so it really does go to the left this time. So we'll try this. Zero. Don't need that. One. I'm going to make this longer. Oh, this is not helpful. Two. Four. Six. Eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. So something like that. I could have sixteen over here. I do not know why that's doing that. Over on this particular side, what I would end up is having cost. I'd probably have to put a number somewhere like that. Um, if I look, it goes up to 45 bucks, so I'm going to have to use $10 a line. Again, I want to be as consistent as I possibly can be. So with something like this, I'm going to have 10 here. I'm going to go up to 20, 30, 40, 50. And I know those all say 10 right now, but just wait. And normally I'd label all the way up. But again, this is taking me too long to do. Okay, 
so that's not too bad. So that's what I've got. So now when I look at plotting these out, these aren't in the order. They don't go from lowest to highest. Sometimes people screw up and they put like, hey, my amount of gallons down here, this would be eight, and then this would be five, and this would be 10. Nope, the numbers go in order. You plot the points then based on where those fall. So in this particular case, let's say I wanna make a dot here. Oh my, that is a large dot. I'm gonna make that kind of small. I'm gonna also fill it in. Okay, so that's a point. I'm gonna end up having a bunch of those. Yeah, I know, I don't know what's doing. Okay, so I have a point here. I'm gonna be at eight gallons and 25 bucks. So that's gonna be like right around here. Then I'm gonna end up having another one which is five gallons and $15. So right around here. I'm gonna have another one, 10 gallons and $32.29, that's somewhere around this. And then I'm gonna want it two gallons, and that's gonna be around $7. Hey, how about don't show that message again? And then have one at 15 gallons, and it's at $45. So if I look at this, they look like they're in pretty much of a straight line, and Um, in fact, I could make a line of best fit. And it should make sense it would start at zero because zero gallons should cost zero dollars. So notice this doesn't have to go through all the points, but does something like that. That's a pretty good line of best fit. And the slope of this means something. So a lot of times the area and the, and the slope of a graph in science means something. This slope tells us the cost per gallon of gas. It's a rate, something per something else. So if I look at this slope, it looks to me like it's a little bit, if I go 10 gallons here, it's a little above 30 bucks. So it's about $3.10 or $3.20 a gallon. If I had another line, and I'll change that color for dramatic effect, red. If I had a line like this, that would say that, hey, gas is a lot cheaper. Now I only have to spend um, $20 to get 10 gallons of gas, whereas up here I need to spend about $32. With something like this, that means I'd have to spend about $60 to get 10 gallons of gas. So the slope of the line tells us something about the cost. Um, all right, that's all I think I've got for this.